This is the presentation that I gave at the NSTA 2017 National Conference in Los Angeles. I'm going to go through each slide and talk about the things that I talked about then. You can get videos of how to build eco columns and how to take data at this website, teachingapscience.com. So a lot of people ask why eco columns? And there are a lot of APES topics that you can cover, um, as, as well as NGSS, Science and Engineering Practices, NGSS Cross-Curricular um, Connections, and also Common Core State Standards for Writing, Math, Speaking, and Listening. So there's a lot of things that you can cover. So there are a couple of different ways you can build eco columns. If you look at this paper here, we have this method. This is the one that I'm going to go through, which is using um, water bottles. This is a gallon sized water bottles. The other method is using um, two liter bottles. Either method works. Um, I prefer the water bottles because they are more sturdy. And actually my picture here shows one with uh, really dirty water, which I'm going to teach you how to avoid the dirty water. These are the College Board uh, topics that Eco Columns covers. And so I went to the College Board website and I picked out the specific ones that we cover in Eco Columns from soil to ecosystem structure to energy flow, a lot with your biogeochemical cycles and then also some water pollution issues as well. Specifically for NGSS science and engineering practices, obviously the big one here is developing and using models because really that's what an ecosystem is, is building a model eco, I'm sorry, that's what an eco column is, it's building a model ecosystem. But also the kids are also carrying about investigation and taking a lot of data. This one is a little bit weaker in that um, they're not particularly setting up hypotheses and experimental design, but they are carrying out investigations using tools. They are doing a lot of analyzing and interpreting data. So the two strongest ones are two and four for eco columns. These are the specific cross-cutting concept, concepts that we hit pretty um, regularly in eco columns, cause and effect, systems and system models, and stability and change. I actually do have a document that goes over all of the NGSS cross-cutting concepts and science and engineering practices and common core state standards and how eco columns fits into the ones that are on this um, presentation. So with our Common Core Acre Standards, now Anchor Standards for my particular district are the standards they felt that all subject areas could work on and so these are the particular Anchor Standards that Eco Columns fits nicely with. So you can go ahead and just Google uh, Common Core State Standard Writing 1 and you can read what it actually is or Math Practice 4 but these are the ones. Kids all the time have to really, really communicate very well with each other. And I have this picture without the faces, but they are uh, collaborating and communicating about their eco column. And that really hits your speaking and listening standard one. So my meme, um, it is actually rather difficult to build correctly. When I say difficult, I mean that if you have good instructions, it's not hard, but you have to follow the instructions carefully. And the problems arise when students or teachers don't follow the instructions um, precisely, then usually that's when problems happen. So let's go over. These are some of the basic materials that are needed to actually build the initial build process. You will need um, a colander to rinse gravel, buckets to collect donated water if you choose to do this one. This one is optional depending on um, how you uh, gather your water. You need cutting supplies for the students and you need sand, gravel, and potting soil and you need a light source of some kind and we'll go over all of these. 
So the first thing is that students need to bring in water bottles. Now, these are the exact water bottles. Um, it has to be the Crystal Geyser brand or the same bottle in a generic. Like, for example, there's a store called Sprouts that has the exact bottle with their brand, and that's fine. You actually need three of them, but I tell students they're in groups of four to bring in four because inevitably about half the time students cut one of the bottles wrong and then they need a spare. I've had students cut three bottles wrong and then they've had to beg and borrow from other student groups who didn't need some bottles because they kept cutting bottles wrong. So my students can either bring in the bottles empty so they drank the water or they can bring it in full and they can donate the water to be used later in the aquatic chambers. And so they're going to cut the bottles to look like this. And I hand out specific instructions with the picture. It's a picture guide to help them build the eco columns. And then they're also going to use a poker and a tea light to poke holes in the sprinkler. And the sprinkler is going to go on the very top of the column. So my students, again, most of them will donate the water. So I just bought a couple of years ago these buckets from Lowe's that are only used for eco-columns. They don't contain anything else. Um, they're only used for a couple of weeks for eco-column water. And basically the kids pour it in the buckets and then I cover it with plastic wrap and I store it and for two weeks until we actually need purified water to build the aquatic chamber. So students need two lids for their eco columns. They use the lids from the water bottles and they're going to use a hot dissecting probe to build um, your drainage caps. Now it's really, really, really important that they measure. So the two measurements are one millimeter and three millimeters in diameter. So you want one that's three millimeter holes and one millimeter holes. The three millimeter holes go with the soil and the terrestrial chamber and this prevents clogs because the soil, um, silt in the soil tends to clog. And so if you actually measure and students need to measure and actually measure that their diameters are three millimeters and if they do that they won't clog. Students who fudge it because they get tired of actually doing this process, they actually love it, but on occasion they get tired of it and they get lazy. And when they clog, I ask them, well, did you measure? No, I didn't measure. They need to measure. Now, on the other hand, for the filter chamber, it needs to be one millimeter. If it's larger, the sand will actually go through and they'll lose a lot of sand into the aquatic chamber. Now it's not a problem for sand to be in the bottom of the aquatic chamber, but then you're losing a lot of sand um, that you need in the filter chamber. So really, really important, these two numbers. Another way to make drainage holes is to um, put a string through two of the caps. You only need two caps. And you can actually um, create a larger hole use a, using the poker the same way. This is a fellow teacher, uh, Laura Solares, who teaches in the same district at a different high school. And she does not allow her students to use the pokers. So she actually creates the string herself. She says it's very quick. And she creates two of these um, with no knots, one that goes into the filter chamber and one that goes in between the filter and the aquatic chamber. And so she builds these for the students. They bring her the uh, caps and she builds these while the kids are doing the other parts. So what should you do? Well, it just depends on your students. You know your students and you know what you can trust them with or not and how responsible they are. And you can make that decision professionally on what you want to do. All right, so you really want good quality potting soil. Do not get the cheap stuff. So I actually took this picture um, last year and I got one bag of the cheap stuff and one bag of miracle Grow. And I opened up the cheap stuff and I went, this is terrible. 
Um, the cheap stuff tends to have too much silt and it is does first of all your plants don't grow very well and secondly it will flush through really really dirty water so the better quality spend a few more dollars and get really high quality potting soil mix it will make all the difference um, I tend to like clay sand the best um, Construction sand will work if you uh, go to the hardware store and you ask for the cleanest of the construction sand um, if they don't have play sand. Play sand is usually cleaner. It's not always clean. Um, sometimes, some years, we get batches that aren't very clean for even play sand, but most of the time it's, it's good. And then you can just get gravel. Um, from the garden store, the hardware store, pea pebble gravel works great. The thing about the gravel though is that it's nice and cheap, it's like $3 a bag, um, but you have to rinse it. And this is where the colanders come into play. I have one colander per group, I bought them at the dollar store. And the kids can rinse, 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 rinse their gravel. It needs to be super, super clean. So they're going to build it and the instructions are going to tell them to put gravel down here at the base of their caps and then one of the chambers gets filled halfway with potting soil and the other chamber gets filled about seven to eight inches with sand and then you're going to flush 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 so I have these plastic beakers that the kids set the chambers on top of and they will spend about a half an hour on the first day just flushing this through actually it's more like 15 minutes now my periods are the traditional 55 minute periods so usually it's the last 10 or 15 minutes of the first day that they finally can get to the point where they're going to pour water in and they're going to flush 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 um, and then the next day they're going to flush 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 some more and then toward the end of the period they will plant their seeds so um, a lot of times they just have to sit around and let them drain. It's very normal for the sand to drain slower than the potting soil. So the sand will drain about a third as fast as the potting soil. Again, I have this on my website where the videos will show you exactly what to do. So toward the end of the second day, maybe the last 10 or 15 minutes of the period, students are going to plant their seeds. So for me, I really um, like them to plant, well, it's mandatory that they plant a legume, and so the, you're going to learn about nitrogen fixation. And then you can also pick other things like herbs or flowers or grasses. I always pick things that germinate quickly and I stay away from flowers because it's very rare that flowers actually get to the blooming stage. Usually they run out of room, so that's a limiting factor. Um, I really like to choose herbs. Then the kids can actually rub them and smell the fragrance or actually eat them too, which is really fun for them. Um, radishes grow really quickly, but they don't really grow a radish in the ground. Um, so they're okay in terms of that they'll grow fast, um, but in terms of if you want kids to actually eat the plants or be able to have a quick um, kind of satisfaction, um, I recommend herbs. Now we plant five seeds, so we do two legumes and three of some other seeds, and really that's like way too much for the soil, but it's fun for them, but they tend to... Um, have the space in the soil and nutrients as a limiting factor after a few weeks. Really the amount of soil should really only plant one seed, but we plant five just because I want the kids to be taking data. So my students set up a spreadsheet. We are fortunate to have um, Chrome carts and so I put one computer for each of my lab tables. So I have nine lab tables and nine groups of four and so I just sign out for the day nine computers one for each lab table and my kids are very careful I tell them that the computer needs to be 
on the opposite side of the table as the eco column because I don't want any water in the computers. But my district knows that computers need to be used and they need to be used in labs. So um, we haven't had any issues, but um, it, they're fine with us using them in the lab. So what I do is we are a GAPE school, Google Apps for Education, and one student will go ahead and set up the spreadsheet and then he's going to share it with everybody in their group and also with me so I can spot check their data. And um, we also rotate. So it cannot be the same kid taking data on the spreadsheet every time. So I take data about once a week for eco columns and they have to rotate who's actually on the computer using the spreadsheet so everyone gets practice. I also, in my instructions for the kids, in their big picture instructions, is instructions on how to make a spreadsheet. My students actually don't know a lot about computers and spreadsheets because they don't have a mandatory computer class. Now some know about it, but the majority do not. So it is a teaching moment. I do have to teach them how to create and use spreadsheets. Here is an example of one of my uh, groups this year, so period six, group seven. This is their spreadsheet data. This is not the full data. The next slide shows you more. So you can see all of the things that we measure every single time um, we go into lab, except we don't take these ones yet. These are blank because we don't create the aquatic chamber for two weeks, so we don't have those measurements. If we did not take a reading, we leave it blank. It's not a zero because students always want to add a zero, but a zero is an actual quantity. And if we didn't measure it, we don't know if it was zero or not. So that's one thing that I have to teach the students. Now, when you start out at eco columns, you're not going to be able probably to take all of the data that my students take. I've been doing this for 10 years, and I've been building up my arsenal of probeware and devices and ways to take data through grants. So all of this did not come the first year or the second year or the third. In fact, there were th there's one probe that's brand new to me on my 10th year. So start with what you have and just add on as you get funds. And so also on their spreadsheet, they have to do observations and adjustments. And this is how I spot check that they are taking turns um, with the data. All right, so um, students should be able to measure plant height and the lodia length. So the lodia actually will come in just a minute, or actually in two weeks. So the lodia is not right away, but this is within a couple of days. So after planting seeds, the seeds will usually germinate um, the legumes within three or four days and the basil and cilantro usually before a week. Some of the other things take 10 to 14 days and so I usually check the back of the seed packages and I choose the ones that are the quickest to germinate. And so that's part of their data also. So this is my newest probe. Um, I used some funds last year to buy one for each group and so they're able to measure their pH, temperature, and fertility. So when we start to take data I go over instructional notes. So on the board before we go into lab they will take notes about um, certain topics that they're going to be measuring that day in their eco columns. And over time, they're going to be going to be adding to their instructional notes uh, a little bit and a little bit. There's actually a really a lot to learn if you're methodical about helping the kids with the information. And so here in bold, um, so within the first few days of eco columns, we would have some instruction um, that the students will take notes about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and pH and why those things are important for the plants. We're going to discuss how temperature affects germination and also how quickly the plants grow depending on temperature of the soil. Alright, so um, 
as part of their data, they need to write down their adjustments and observations. One of the things that students have a hard time with is they make an observation like the plants are dying, and that's actually an inference, not an observation. Um, they should write the plants are ye turning yellow and wilting. So that's one thing they need to be trained on as well. You'll notice here how dirty the water is because we have not created the aquatic chamber yet. We are waiting two weeks to, to build the aquatic chamber. It is not built yet. And so when students take data at this point in time, they are still draining their eco columns. And so the water is still going to be dirty until we build our aquatic chamber. Alright, so um, about two or four or five days after you build your eco column, just right after the seeds start germinating, it's a really good idea to start adding uh, detritivores. So I tell my kids they have to add one or two worms and a few other detritivores. So they have to make, add worms so they can dig them up in the yard or they can buy them at a bait store and actually in our town Walmart has a fishing section with a little fridge that you can buy worms. And so you can see over here, these are pictures of all the worms that kids brought in. So we have our night crawlers, which are traditional worms, and then we have mealworms, which is actually a larva. Uh, I think it's beetle larva, I'm not totally sure about that. Um, and so those are fine too. I tell them to look under rocks for pill bugs or roly polies, for pincher bugs, for beetles. Those are all great. What you don't want is herbivores or carnivores. So sometimes students will bring in a beautiful caterpillar and then the next day they are devastated because the caterpillar has eaten all their plants. So no herbivores. Carnivores like spiders or ladybugs. Well, first the ladybugs will fly away. And secondly, um, they need to have food. So you can't put a spider in because there's no food and the spider will actually leave. And then you're going to have them go out into the schoolyard and just get some dead or live leaves. It doesn't matter. They need to tear them up and put them on top of their soil uh, like this. And this is leaf litter. So this day that we do this method, so this is about four or five days after the seeds have been planted and they started to germinate, we are going to take notes discussing the purposes of leaf litter. So leaf litter provides hiding places for your detritivores. 
It's going to decompose and provide nutrition for the soil. It's going to um, be a buffer for proper pH. It's also going to uh, retain moisture, so it's going to prevent evaporation out of the soil. So lots of really good purposes for leaf litter. And so now we've worked in a forestry concept in this um, lab as well. We're also going to discuss detritivores. So in our instructional notes before we go into lab this day, detritivores will be discussed. All right, so whining is coming. Students at this point really, 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 really are begging for a fish. No fish. Fish need to stay in your fish tank or other bowl um, until two weeks have passed. So two weeks from the first day you started building your eco column is when you'll start to build your aquatic chamber. These are my uh, aquariums. I have breeding supply of Gambusia, which is mosquito fish. My original batch I got donated from Vector Control through our health department. So I called up the LA County Department of Health. They're Vector Control, so these are the people that help mosquito abatement or rats or other vectors that carry disease. And they donated a bunch of mosquito fish. So they put mosquito fish in uh, of like four closed home pools that aren't being taken care of to prevent mosquitoes. So they gave me a bunch and they have been breeding in my tanks for the past few years. And so the kids use them and then put them back. I let them take them home too if they want to, but these are the strongest fish. Guppies are also pretty decent in eco columns, but the reason why I like Gambusia or guppies is because they can tolerate cold water and dirty water, and they're very hardy fish. They also don't produce a ton of waste, and they don't usually devour the Elodia plant. So this is the Elodia plant here. Goldfish tend to make their water very filthy. They also will devour the Elodia rather quickly. Same with rosy reds. Those are all feeder fish at the pet store. They don't work very well. Students sometimes like to bring in betta fish, and betta fish are actually carnivores, so they're kind of starving the whole time that they're in the eco columns, and that's not great either. But again, no fish yet. Okay, so now after two weeks, it's time to build the aquatic chamber. And so what they're going to do is they're going to empty the bottom bottle that they've been flushing for the past two weeks, and they're going to rinse some more gravel and place in the bottom of their chamber and fill it halfway with purified water. So now we're going to use the water that's in the buckets and they're going to fill it about halfway. And so now we're going to take our water quality tests. So we're going to measure our nitrites and nitrates. And since everyone's starting out with the same water, we're just going to use one test strip to save money. And then we're going to measure an elodia and add it. Um, now, no fish yet because the elodia should be wet from an established fish tank. The wet elodia will have nitrifying bacteria on it, and that nitrifying bacteria needs to colonize your aquatic chamber before you add fish. So still no fish. You need to wait at least two more days before you add fish because the bacteria from the wet elodia, again, it's in the water on the wet elodia, it's nitrifying bacteria and it needs to colonize your aquatic chamber. And the nitrifying bacteria is super important, so now you take notes on nitrification. So, um, this uh, to give credit where credit is due. Here is the credit for this particular drawing. And um, this is the way to discuss it. So we're going to talk about fish waste. And fish waste, here we have poop, has tons of ammonia. And so our nitrosomous bacteria that was on the wet elodia will turn it first into nitrites, and the nitrobacter will turn it into nitrates. 
And the Elodia will love the nitrates, and so will your terrestrial chamber plants if you water with some of the aquatic chamber into the terrestrial chamber. So now they need to take notes on nitrification. So after two days, it's time to add the fish. So after you've created your aquatic chamber, you do not want to flush large amounts of water through your eco column anymore because the water has gotten clearer and clearer over the past two weeks, but it's still not totally clear. Usually, on occasion it is, um, but usually not totally clear. So we just want to water our plants just enough to have a few drips go to the bottom. What I start to have my students do, especially after we have um, fish in our aquatic chamber, is that we, I have them scoop with this little um, 50 ml beaker um, out of the aquatic chamber and into the terrestrial chamber. And then they'll also supplement with some more tap water as well. And you just want a few drips to go through the bottom. So now we're going to discuss nutrient cycling because down here from the fish waste, um, we're going to have nitrates and phosphates primarily and some other stuff too. But in fish waste, that's going to happen. And we're going to take those nitrates and phosphates and we're going to add them to the plants. And the plants are going to really enjoy that. And so in our notes, once we start to do this, um, then eco column instructional notes, and kids are going to copy this down, um, the nutrient cycling that's occurring. Okay, so once you've created your aquatic chamber, again, before fish, uh, you're going to measure with some probes. So the first probe that I get is dissolved oxygen. If you have any money, you need to buy a dissolved oxygen probe. They can run between $150 to $300. The brand that I tend to have had really good luck with is Milwaukee brand, but I also know that some of the optical probes from Vernier or Pasco are really good. The regular dissolved oxygen probes from Vernier needs calibration too often, so you really want an optical probe. Um, I believe these are around $250 to $300 from Carolina. On Amazon they're cheaper, it just depends on where you can order from. But even if you can't afford a lot of them, just buy one and have the kids rotate. I actually wrote, I have three or four of each probe out and the kids will rotate those probes between groups. And so I don't have one for each group because they are very expensive, but extremely important because kids will really understand a lot of concepts if they're measuring dissolved oxygen. And then temperature. Mine happens to be a vernier probe, but that's like the most expensive way to take temperature. Just use a thermometer. Okay, and in the instructional, um, when they take notes before they create the aquatic chamber, you should discuss the importance of temperature. Now, our eco columns are going to be at room temperature, but they need to know why temperature is a water quality measurement has to do with dissolved oxygen. The colder the water, the more the dissolved oxygen. Also, certain species like a certain temperature range. And so it's a very important water quality measurement. pH um, is important as well. Um, so pH will kind of go up and down depending on what kinds of cellular respiration and photosynthesis is going on in there. Um, not dramatically, just a little bit. Probes are the best. You can use pH paper, but you're not going to notice the slight changes without a probe. You can get pretty cheap probes. I think these ones here I got on Amazon for about $15, but you can get pH probes kind of anywhere. Um, pH probes tend to fall out of calibration about once a week, so I have actually trained a student service uh, lab assistant that's a student who... Um, is what had me for apes last year. I trained him and he can calibrate the probes for me, which is a big help. And then we also test nitrites and nitrates through test strips. Now, at once upon a time, I did use nitrate, a nitrate probe that we rotated, but the nitrate probe had trouble with calibration. It would fall out of calibration at least every week and sometimes right in the middle of the day or right in the middle of the period. And it was just so highly frustrating that um, I finally, 
I had to throw it out. And so I've been using the test strips ever since. So nitrates will build up over time from five parts per million to 10 to even 50 parts per million. That's fine. Fish can tolerate high levels of nitrates. Nitrites will eventually go down to zero, which kind of um, is strange for the kids to have it at zero, but that's actually normal. Once your nitrifying bacteria starts to colonize and be really a thriving population of nitrifying bacteria, it will quickly, quickly change the ammonia into uh, nitrates. So the nitrite is the in-between stage. So it goes from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, and it's only temporarily at nitrites. And so if it's going quickly, you're going to have a nice buildup of nitrates and zero nitrites. And that's normal. So the first year or two that I taught eco columns, it was very hard for me to figure out all the things that they're supposed to learn. Um, and I think this is a very common problem that newer AP environmental science or environmental science teachers have is that we don't always know all the connections that uh, we're supposed to make for our students. And we have to make them for them. Eco columns can be inquiry in some ways, but in a lot of things in eco columns, everything is kind of abstract. The um, cycling of nutrients, the microorganisms, things that are not easily uh, observable unless students are pointed in the right direction. So what I tend to do is I give notes and I do have a set of instructional notes that uh, I have made and uh, again I think I've mentioned this before in the video I go I give a little bit at a time so I spread out this information over several weeks and so on a day that we are going to go in and take eco column um, data um, or we're going to do something to the ecocom, they're going to take some notes first. And so I have a picture here of my board, and I'm explaining this is the day that we're going to add fish. And I'm explaining to them what's going on inside the aquatic chamber and why we can add fish at that time because the nitrifying bacteria have colonized, and now the fish waste, which is full of ammonia, um, will be turned into nitrates because ammonia is very toxic for fish and nitrates is not as toxic and so we want to make sure that our ammonia is turned into nitrates and so I give them these notes now if you have more time if you're not um, teaching an AP class and you're just teaching a regular env environmental science class you would have time to work inquiry in where the students would take the time to walk through the processes of figuring out these kinds of things. Um, unfortunately, in an AP class, I find that I don't have enough time for the kids to do a whole lot of inquiry with the eco columns um, to come to these concepts themselves a little bit, but not a whole lot due to the lack of time. After I give these notes, and again, I spread out my notes a little bit each day before we go into the lab, um, and we don't go to the lab every single day. Um, when we build, we're in the lab for about two days a week, um, for the first couple of weeks, and then after that, it's one day a week. And before we go in the lab, we'll take some notes and then go in and do data for about 15 minutes. And my students split up the tasks. I have four kids in a group. One group is gonna open up the computer and take spreadsheet data and the other three are going to split up the tasks. One person's going to man the ruler and measure the height of the plants in the Elodia, and one person's going to use the soil probe and get those measurements, and another person's going to work on water quality probes. And so when they all divvy up the work, it's 15 minutes a week. <clears throat> so after several weeks of taking notes, now we're going to check to see if they really understand what's going on. So I give them this paper called EcoColumn Check for Understanding, and they sit in the lab, they observe their eco columns, and so in this way it's, it is a, a bit of a form of inquiry, and they're gonna use their notes. So you can see here that my students have their notes in front of them, and they have their eco column here, and this is the worksheet, uh, the Check for Understanding worksheet. And so they discuss, and so these are your speaking and listening standards, 
and they are helping each other uh, work through the questions to really make sure that they're understanding all of the scientific concepts they're supposed to know. So some troubleshooting things. This I have this picture here of an ecocom that has it looks dirty. Now, my students like to use the word dirty, but dirty is a very a vague term. What does that mean? Um, so specifically, this water is not clear, but does that make it bad? And I point out to my students that fish live in lakes and in streams and ponds and the ocean that's not always clear. So at what point or at what, what type of dirty or pollution is not good for them? So this particular color can be caused by uh, sediments and you don't want a lot of suspended solids, a lot of suspended sediments because it will clog the gills. Or it could be caused by tannins. So this is the um, in your soil and in your leaf litter, you're going to have plant pigments called tannins. And it could be from either one. You can do a test of um, suspended solids. Um, or even dissolved solids through conductivity, but most of the time I can kind of eyeball it. And if it's just a slight brown or orange color, it's usually fine. If it's cloudy, uh, it could mean that there's a lot of suspended sediments. But if the fish is living, it seems to be okay. So just because the, it turns a brown color does not necessarily mean that it's going to be bad for the fish. When I first started using these um, water bottles instead of soda bottles, our dissolved oxygen levels were really low. And I believe this is a picture from a few years ago. And there was really dissolved oxygen problems. And so what we did to sort of remedy is first we lowered the water level. And that allowed more space up here for oxygen from the atmosphere to dissolve into the water. The second thing we did was we cut flaps. And I believe on my earlier slides I showed you what that was. So right about here we cut flaps on either side and also on this side. Not on all four sides because you're going to lose some structural integrity in the plastic and it might not hold up as well. Um, so there are instructions. It's about a three centimeter square um, flap. And once we did that, we added this hole. I mean, you can make it a flap or you can cut off the flap and make it a hole. So once we added that and we reduced the water level, the dissolved oxygen levels came back up and it solved the problem. All right, so what if your fish does die? And you know what? Kids always learn more from a dead fish than they do from an alive fish. So what do you do? Well, you take that fish, you take a little plastic spoon, you dig a hole, you have a little funeral ceremony, and you bury dead fish into the soil. And this is great because this is all about nutrient cycling. And the kids will usually notice a spike in plant growth. So your plants are going to grow um, more quickly that week when the um, fish is buried in it. And they may also, if you happen to have a soil probe, they may also notice an increase in fertility. Usually not a whole lot because it is one tiny fish um, that's being decomposed in there. My students, when they have a dead fish, do not get a new one right away. What I want to make sure is the decomposing bacteria has decomposed and died off. So I want to wait for bacteria to die off in my aquatic chamber. So my students have to wait a week. And then they're going to measure their dissolved oxygen level. And I want it to be above 3 milligrams per liter before I will let them get a new fish. Sometimes it's really interesting because they can't find their fish anymore. So after a while, they're only checking their ecocoms about once every week and taking data. And if the fish had died a few days previously, um, sometimes they completely decompose, bones and all, 
and there is no trace of the fish at all left in there, which is pretty fascinating. We do learn from that. And they also notice that usually if that happens, if their fish has disappeared, then also their nitrate levels have shot up too, which is a pretty interesting thing for them. Sometimes we've been infested by bugs, and so this would be up here in the terrestrial chamber. We've had aphid infestations, we've had gnats and other invertebrate bugs um, come in, fruit flies, and this is a really good learning opportunity. Uh, one other thing uh, too is that sometimes the plants develop a plant fungus um, or some other issue with the plants, and it's really interesting because they'll notice the disease, whether it's um, a microorganism disease or a, an invertebrate um, insect, they will notice it traveling from uh, eco column to eco column, um, and so they'll notice that they are really they're stored really close together on the plant lights, and it's a really good opportunity to learn about plant patterns. They don't know very much about plants. As well, which is great because um, on the AP test they often ask about things that will kill the um, the forests. Things like bark beetle. There was an FRQ that I actually graded in Cincinnati my first year I was a grader, and it was about beetles eating forests in the East Coast, the deciduous forest. Okay, the Elodia dying. Uh, some of my students, it's the same batch of Elodia from the pet store or from Carolina. Sometimes they thrive and sometimes they die. And I really don't have a great explanation as to one or the other. Sometimes a student just has a really hungry fish and they eat up all of the leaves on the Elodia. And then sometimes same species of fish, some fish don't hardly eat it at all. Some melodia starts to grow really, really well, beautiful new green growth, and some just die off and decompose in the eco calm. Um, it's a nice thing for students to ask questions about. In science, we got to ask questions, and we have to teach kids to ask questions without necessarily finding out the answers, but to just continue to ask a lot of questions. So the hungry fish go along with that. On occasion, I'll let my students replace their elodia if their fish has completely devoured it, if I have any to spare. Um, one of the things that's the problem with the cheap feeder fish at the pet store, the goldfish or the rosy reds, is that they devour the elodia. And so not it's not great to use those fish, but I understand, and I've had to use them in a pinch as well. So I've already been over this, so my students take data for 15 minutes once a week once the eco columns are established, and I split them up, um, and all four kids in a group have different tasks to do to get done in 15 minutes, and they will be trained. They might not be as quick at the beginning, but I have a timer, and I give them a countdown, and I'm, uh, they can get it done. And we take data for about 8 to 10 weeks. So after about 8 to 10, eight to ten weeks, the eco columns start to degrade. Really, the, the roots in the terrestrial column, they all run out of room. The plants start um, wilting or turning colors or diseases move in. And they really start to, to degrade. And so it's time to wrap up the eco column and start to analyze all of the data that kids took over time. So my students, I let them take home the mosquito fish if they want to. Most of them uh, decide to just put it back in my fish tank, but they can take it home, I don't mind. So what we do is they empty all of the chambers and the planters around school, with uh, around the different plants, and then we recycle the bottles. If you want to, it's, it's kind of a nice idea to keep a few of the ecocoms for open house. The plants might be all dead before open house in the spring. I do this in the fall, and uh, a few built ones are good, and you can just put some more seeds in and have things grow about a month before open house. Can you keep your bottles and have kids from the next years use them? 
You can if you have the storage space. That's a lot of storage space. But um, the plastic gets a little crinkly, and it, the eco columns don't stay up very well with crinkled plastic. So in some ways, it's better to start out with fresh bottles each year. Um, but I understand that in some places, you may have trouble with kids bringing in bottles. And so you might want to just collect them yourself over several months and save them from year to year. Um, I find that students really enjoy the building process and they take ownership of, ownership of it. So when they build it and they solve the clogging problems and they do the cutting and they make the holes, they really take a lot of value. And when they enjoy something and take ownership of it, they're going to learn a lot. So my students do data analysis and I've done it differently in different years. What I tend to do right now is I require them to make graphs and since they take a lot of different data points each person in their group must create two unique graphs using the spreadsheet and so they all open up their own copy of the spreadsheet and I teach them how to create graphs. So I have a how to graph using Google Sheets to help them because most of them have never created an electronic graph before. Now, for the AP test, students need to know how to hand draw a graph. And so I do a lot of that in my class as well. Most of the time they are hand drawing graphs. And actually data and research back that up that kids need to hand draw them. However, when they get into college, they are going to need to create electronic graphs for their lab reports, is what I've been hearing from my students who are now in college. They really need that skill. And so this particular lab, since we took all the data on spreadsheets, I take the opportunity to teach them how to create graphs from spreadsheets. Uh, a lot of times I do analysis questions as a group. I used to do them individually, but I found that kids gave much better answers when they were allowed to collaborate as a group and discuss. And they learned a lot more. Um, and so here's your speaking and listening standards as well. And they came up with much better answers for their analysis questions. Here's an example of a couple of different graphs that are made from Google Sheets. So assessment. Um, individual lab report, if you have a small class, go for it. But an, a lab report for EcoCollins is several pages. It's eight to 10 pages long, even longer, depending on what you ask them to do. I personally don't want to read all of those since I have over 150 APE students. So I, when I do lab reports for EcoCollins, I usually do it as a group. And each kid is designed different sections. And over the past couple years, though, I don't actually create a lab report for eco columns. My students actually need to memorize all the information on their notes and their check for understanding paper. And they're going to take an eco column test with complex questions that are AP level. And I find because the eco column lab did not follow a traditional lab. Um, report simulation with your question and your hypothesis and your procedure because we did lots of different things at different times and we took different types of data at different times and so I find that the lab report option is not um, always the best and I want to make sure that they are memorizing pieces of information and so that's why I have migrated to the test over the past couple of years. Some other ideas that could be used is you could do presentations. You can have the kids make videos. Um, there's something called Flipgrid where they can make small videos every week that they take data and then compile them. And so there are some other creative ways that I haven't yet explored to assess eco columns. So eco columns is not a classic 5e, but if you needed to put the different sections into the 5e format, this is what you would do. And again, it's not a, a traditional 5e with a lot of inquiry in the explore section. It, there is because the kids are interested and they are asking questions and they are trying to figure out what's going on with their eco column, but it's done informally, not formally in an explore section.
All right, and so that was the end of my presentation. And again, a lot of the resources that I've used are at this website.